Hello and welcome to the Archaeology of London pubs with Dig Ventures. Um, I'll let you know I've poured myself a little drink to keep us company while we're here. Um, I'm just going to take a second to share my screen. One moment. Right. Is that all nice and clear for everyone? Brilliant. We can all see everything and we can all hear everything. It sounds like we are ready to go. So yeah, as I said, hello and welcome to the Archaeology of London pubs with Dig Ventures. My name is Maya and I'm an archaeologist and head of community at Dig Ventures. And here with me tonight is Steph, my fellow archaeologist and program manager at Dig Ventures. Behind the scenes, we've also got Ginny, one of our brilliant community archaeologists and tonight's virtual bouncer. So behave. Um, for those of you who are new to us, I'll just give you a quick background as to who Dig Ventures actually is and what we do. So Dig Ventures was born from a mission to connect people who love archaeology with opportunities to actually do archaeology. So Basically, in a nutshell, we organise archaeological digs that anyone can be part of. We also host monthly online events like this one and online courses, all of which are supported by our community of subscribers. So if you enjoy tonight's event, then head to digventures.com forward slash subscribe to find out about how you can enjoy more stuff like this by becoming a subscriber. And if you've ever dreamed of being an archaeologist, then check out digventures.com forward slash projects to find out how you can join us on a dig this summer. Right, so why are we actually talking about pubs tonight? Um, well, as archaeologists, after a long day of digging, we do love heading to the pub to argue over what we've discovered that day. We've even dug up the remains of a Roman mancio, which is basically the equivalent of a Roman inn. But most importantly, Steph, and this is going to make a lot of you jealous, actually did her PhD on the topic. Her PhD title was Taverns, Inns and Alehouses, an Archaeology of Consumption Practices in the City of London. And that basically meant that she got to spend three years rummaging through the ruins of London's ancient drinking holes, trying to understand what was going on inside. Who were the clientele? What were they ordering? How were they being depicted? And what does this tell us about the origins of modern British pub culture and the society that it actually arose in? So today, the UK has over 40,000 pubs. The story of how we got here has a lot more twists and turns than you'd expect, and it's certainly full of some surprises. So place your orders at the bar now, because tonight we're going to take you on an epic pub crawl spanning more than 2000 years. We'll end up in the 16th and 17th and 18th century London, and we'll explore it together through the eyes of an archaeologist. And that archaeologist is, of course, Steph. Before we start, though, we do have a little bit of housekeeping to do. So first up, house rules. Number one, keep it friendly. Our bouncer will remove anyone who is rude or disruptive. If you want to ask us questions at the end, then use the Q&A feature to submit them and we'll come to them all at the end. If you want to chat or comment or respond while we're talking, then use the chat feature to do that. We love seeing everyone chat and respond to what we're saying, and it's lovely seeing you all introduce yourselves in the chat right now. However, some people do find the chat distracting, and if that's likely to be you, then just close the panel and turn off the notifications and it shouldn't bother you at all. Finally, please be patient with us. Sometimes things go wrong. This is technology. Maybe our Wi-Fi connection drops. Or maybe we spill our beers all over the keypad and uh, have a bit of a whoopsie. Um, so yeah, be patient with us. If anything goes a bit funky or, or you know, we start breaking up, just, just give us a couple of minutes to, to get ourselves back on track. Finally, I am going to put a content warning here. Um, most of this content that's coming up is PG, but we are going to be talking about alcohol and right at the end there is a little bit of a cheeky surprise um uh, we'll give you another content warning when that's coming up just in case there's any kids here tonight so what have we got coming up 
tonight. We're going to start with a little bit of an icebreaker, which I'm really looking forward to, and I hope you'll all join me in taking part in it. Um, we're then going to whip through a quick history of pubs from 175 BC to 1500 AD. We're then going to have um, a virtual pub crawl of some of my favourite historic London pubs. And then we're going to meet Steph outside one of those historic London pubs uh, where she's going to talk to us about what was really going on in, um, in 16th, 17th and 18th century London. We'll cover loads of interesting topics like how pubs and drinking establishments were depicted and the politics behind them. We'll talk about wealth and class. We'll look at some really surprising things that you wouldn't expect to find in a pub necessarily. We're going to talk about international relations, women in drinking culture, pub songs and court trials, and last but not least, some of the bawdy fun that went down in pubs after all. We'll wrap it all up with a Q&A right at the end, and then we'll raise our glasses to each other before we say goodbye and wrap things up. So I hope you're all ready, because we're about to jump into our icebreaker. So what I want you all to do right now is close your eyes for a moment. And don't worry, because we can't see you, um, so you don't have to worry about looking silly. But sit back and picture your favourite pub. Have a look around. Who can you see? What's on the tables? What's behind the bar? What's hanging on the walls? If you're not in the UK and you don't technically have pubs, then just think about your favourite drinking establishment. Um, yeah, have a think about what's on the table. Are there shot glasses, pint glasses, maybe wine glasses, or even cocktail glasses? Are there plates, cutlery, maybe a mug with one of those wooden spoons with the table number on it? Is there hand sanitizer, newspapers, ashtrays, pictures on the wall of famous visitors? Maybe there's a mic for some live music, turntables, jukeboxes, fruit machines. All of these things might change depending on what time of day or night it is in the pub, what kind of pub or drinking establishment it is, and even whether it's the 1960s, 1990s, or 2022. So picture your favorite drinking establishment, have a look around and try to pick out three objects that would have been there in the pub that might help someone else guess what type of pub it is. When you've got your three objects, drop it in the comments along with the name of the pub. I wanna see what we've all got, so. Are you ready? Give us the name of your favorite drinking establishment and some of the things you would expect to find within it. I'm gonna enter mine in now. This is basically my way of finding out what the best pubs around the world are. Fascinating. There's so some really great ones coming up. The Cheshire Cheese, um, the Crown and Anchor, the Square and Compass, the Duke's Head, um, Blackfriars. I love seeing the range of artifacts that's coming out that you're suggesting as well. Um, an assortment of glasses, heavy wooden tables, cask beer, laughter, bar stools, pub dog, um, tulip glass, log fire, dart boards, hand pumps, sherry glasses, fish and chips, jukebox, carved wall art. Blimey, I'm going to have to go there and have a look. A spittoon, not so keen on that. Um, wine glasses, ashtrays, brilliant stuff. So you can see that there's a huge range of pubs and everyone is different. They have different clientele, different things going on, and it's all visible in the kind of material culture, basically the archaeological remains that's within. So I hope you've enjoyed um, this little icebreaker exercise to warm us all up to the idea of what archaeology can tell us about pubs. Um, we're now going to skip through time uh, rather rapidly with um, a pub crawl that's going to take us from the Roman period right up until the 1500s where we'll meet Steph outside a, a 16th century pub. So let's go. So 
So this is a picture of a Roman tavern and we can indeed trace the history of pubs all the way back to the Roman period. Of course, most cultures prior to the Romans did have their own drinking establishments and drinking culture, but as the Roman Empire expanded, they built roads across the empire to make it easier for their armies and merchants and colonists to travel. And along these roads, maybe every 20 miles or so, there would be a tavern or a taberna. And these taverns were a lot like hostels where you could get a square meal, a night's rest and enjoy the company of others. This one here is an example from Latz in France, and it's been excavated pretty recently. And what the archaeologists found was that it was still absolutely littered with drinking bowls and animal bones more than 2000 years after last orders were taken there. It's located at the intersection of two roads, which is a very con convenient place for it to be. It's got a courtyard, it's got a dining room, you can see with benches around three sides. And when the archaeologists were excavating this area, they figured that the people there would be reclining on the benches while they ate, and they found all kinds of animal bones like wish bones and fish vertebra, vertebra underneath the benches and scattered across the floor where people would have just simply thrown the snacks that they were eating on the floor. They also found millstones, three ovens, um, plates, bowls, serving platters, fish, more animal bones, but the most common object of all were wine cups. So I think this is a really wonderful example of a very, very, very early pub. Um, it would have originally been for travellers, but as the economy diversified, there were a lot more people not growing their own food. So the need for a place where people could eat outside of the home increased. And in fact, locals would then begin to adopt these places as somewhere apart from home and work where they could go to meet other people and eat and drink, discuss politics, farming, business and family matters. So then when the Roman Empire reached the British Isles, they encountered a well-established ale-making culture that was already in place. Um, brewing ale in Britain at the time was often done by women, and this actually infiltrated the Roman tavern system, and women began to own, open up their own domestic dwellings as tav taverns for weary travellers, especially if their husbands were deceased and they needed a way to make a living. We've actually been excavating something a little bit like this in East Yorkshire, where I mentioned earlier that we were uncovering a mancio, which is basically an inn for travelling officials. Uh, it was really fascinating to start uncovering that kind of thing to see what, what material remains it leaves behind and what that can tell us about the people who went there and the people who are running it as well. So let's skip forward a little bit in time to find out what was happening when the Normans were here. So there's a famous quote from John of Salisbury, Bishop of Chartres in 1176, who said, the English are noted among foreigners for their persistent drinking. Uh, and at the time, almost every Anglo-Saxon village would have had an alehouse, also known as a guild house. Um, it was the heart of the community where all important meetings would have taken place, from business transactions to wedding celebrations. And in fact, the word ale comes from the term used for a social gathering and just about any event at the time would merit an ale. Um, we know from archeological evidence that different kinds of beer were available. There would have been bright ale, which as the name suggests would have been clear. There was mild ale, which was, um, you know, well, a little bit stronger. And then there was extra strong twice brewed ale. They would add things like rosemary or yarrow or gale or bog myrtle to add a bit of flavour to them. And Kent was really famous for its beer at the time. And even the French were said to admire English ale, saying it could at the time rival wine in colour and flavour. Um, the Normans introduced cider and by the time we get to the 12th century, it was actually also being made in Kent and was declared the Englishman's drink by Daniel of Beckles, a 12th century etiquette guru. At the time, uh, interest in wine was on the increase, and although it was pretty tough to grow vines in, in Britain at the time, there were about 40 vineyards, I think, in operation um, by the 12th century. So the next thing that we come to are when we get to around the time of the Crusades. So this is a very famous pub um, near Nottingham Castle, which is claimed to date back to 1139, although probably most of the current building is from the mid 1600s. Um, it was previously known as the Pilgrim and it's built into the rock directly below the castle. 
So it's possible that this bit might actually date to when the castle was built in 1067. So it could actually be as old as some people say it is. But what's really interesting about it is the stories that are associated with it. And according to rumours, it's, um, it's the place where many pilgrims or crusaders would stop um, on the start of their journey to Jerusalem. This leads us really nicely into the next thing that happens in within this sort of pub scene in Britain. Um, following the murder of Thomas a Becket in Canterbury, pilgrimages to his shrine and other cathedrals around the country became really fashionable. And it kind of gave pilgrimages a resurgence. Lots more people were out on the road heading off on pilgrimages. One of these journeys was actually described by Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales, where the pilgrims set out from the Tabard in London, which you can see a picture of here, and it was a real inn at the time. So traditionally at the time, um, before this massive resurgence in pilgrimages, travellers would seek overnight accommodation in many monasteries along the way. But the numbers suddenly became so great that the monks couldn't cope with this huge influx of travellers. And enterprising locals therefore set up private inns and took religious names for their inns to imply a monastic connection. So they were trying to attract the people that would usually have stayed in monasteries into their inns. And because the population was illiterate at the time, they used pictorial signs, pub signs. Basically, this is when pub signs got invented and they were used to advertise the inns instead of names. The images were often copied from churches' stained glass windows. So they would have things like pictures of saints and angels and arcs. All of these images would have been familiar and easy to reproduce. However, what happens next? Well, of course, Henry VIII um, broke away from the Catholic faith and um, so began the dissolution of the monasteries. He confiscated their wealth and all of these pubs that had um, religious names were suddenly in a rush to change their name and eradicate any Catholic links. So places that might have been called something like the Ark became the ship. Uh, something that might have been called the Gates to Heaven would become something like the Cross Keys. And many more landlords played safe by adopting names like the King's Head. Obviously, as Henry VIII sold off the monastic lands to, um, to the highest bidders, um, these lands would be taken over by peers and landlords, and many of the nearby pubs would then take on their names too. So, so you might end up with something like the Duke of Norfolk. So this brings us up right to the 16th century. Um, I thought at this point it would be really fun to skip back and have a look at some of London's surviving 16th century pubs so that when we meet Steph to learn more about what was happening inside them and what the archaeology tells us, we have a sort of an idea of what they look like. So I'm just going to skip back through my slides. And let's take a look. So I know there are some of you here today who are big, big fans of historic London pubs. Unfortunately, I couldn't fit them all in, though there are hundreds of ones that are brilliant. But let's start with the Prospect of Whitby, which um, dates back to around 1520 and claims to be one of the oldest river, riverside stories in London. The next one that I thought worth looking at would be Ye Olde Mitre. Um, this one is in Hatton Garden and is said to date to 1546. And the famous story about this one is that Elizabeth I came and danced around a cherry tree here outside. Now I'm sure if you've had some of the nice drinks that are on the menu there, you might be inclined to do the same. The Star Tavern in Belgravia is famous for lots of reasons. I mean, it dates back to nine, uh, nine, uh, 1620, um, but it's the upstairs room where supposedly the great train robbers hatched their plan to attack the mail services in 1963. The Seven Stars is definitely another one that's worth us having a look at. Um, this is one that survived the Great Fire of London. What a miracle. Um, but it's also worth pointing out because it's a good place, you know, if you need a bit of free legal advice, it's a good place to go because it's right next to the Royal Courts of Justice and um, still plays host to crowds of lawyers at the close of day. Last but not least, the, the last pub that I want to show you is called the flask. This is based in Highgate, uh, dates back to 1663. 
And I've chosen this pub to show you because it's where William Hogarth used to drink. And the reason why um, that's going to be important will become very clear in just a second. Um, so at this point, we've had a whistle stop tour of pubs in Britain and how they emerged over 2000 years. We've seen some of the 16th century drinking establishments. And now it's time to meet Steph, who's going to help us dive into the detail of what was happening in 16th, 17th and 18th century London and how our modern pub scene arose. So hi, Steph, are you here? Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Um, lovely to see you and um, great to see, I don't know which pub you're in, um, but it looks a lot more civilized than the one I'm in, so. <laughs> very good, yes. So uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me to talk. You're more than welcome. I think we're all uh, really excited to hear what you've got to say. And I thought it would be a nice thing to start off with a very simple question. What got you into pub archaeology and why do you love it and why should we all love it too? Well, so for me, I, I already had been introduced to, to the British pubs uh, pretty, pretty immediately uh, upon arrival here in the UK, but it was really because I was looking for uh, a topic to study uh, that really encapsulated British identity um, and what better place than at the, the, the pub, the, the, this thing that still today ha has a very unique British culture to it. Um, on top of that, I had a, uh, a fascination, uh, but also an, a pre-existing experience with 17th and 18th century ceramic pottery uh, ident identification. So that's what gave me my kind of my time period. And to top it all off, if, if fate wasn't already screaming at me, the um, Museum of London had a huge amount of uh, drinking vessels uh, and, and other associated material from establishments all over the city from, from very many time periods, but also including uh, the time periods that I was interested in. So it just was, it was meant to be. It's, yeah, what a great subject of study. And it's, it's kind of funny to think that um, it's relatively an understudied area, at least in terms of looking through the archaeological evidence. So important work, important work you're doing. <laughs> um, but a little question that I had, and it's to do with the title of your dissertation, um, which mentions that you were looking at patterns of consumption. And what does that mean, basically? What does that mean? And what do we learn from looking at things in terms of patterns of consumption? So you can tell quite a bit about the things that we that we consume um, from what's available for our consumption, which tells us about political structures and economic circles that thing, that people and things are moving in. Uh, but it also ta talks quite a bit, especially at this time period, uh, when more and more exotic materials are being introduced into everyday society, that like, people are choosing what they are consuming and and how they're consuming it. And that is telling us a lot about, we make a lot of choices uh, when, when it comes to what we, we consume and those things get uh, left in the material record. So it gives us a lot of insight into the individuals and, and that's really interesting to me. Yeah, I think from our, our little exercise earlier where we're all thinking about our favorite pubs and what's inside them, that kind of gives us an idea of, yeah, how changing patterns of consumption can reflect underlying changes in, in society. So really interesting stuff. Um, my next question is, okay, maybe a bit of a daft one, but I think one that maybe we all need to hear the answer to before we go much deeper into pub history. So I've been using the phrase or the word pub pretty loosely so far. I've just been scattering it here and there, not really giving too much thought to how I'm using it. But what exactly is a pub? Because I know it's it's uh, got a fairly particular definition. So what exactly is a pub and how is it different to what came before? Yeah, so well, so a pub to me, uh, it, it is a place where people are kind of freely allowed to, to gather together. There's normally drink and oftentimes food associated, normally alcoholic beverages, often beer or ale. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a public space that people can, can enjoy together. Um, so that is what our kind of modern day understanding of the pub is. It's short for public house. And that, and that was kind of, that, that is what it, what it uh, kind of encapsulates. Um, so 
it, it's not really until the, the the 18th century that you really see the kind of modern emergence of what we consider to be the pub uh, today. There wasn't really such thing beforehand. You had these earlier establishments that you were talking about. You have the inn that dates back uh, quite a long time um, to to the mo more modern day kind of version of it. Um, and if I can share my screen, I will show you guys um, my little timeline here. Is that working all right? Yep. So we've got your timeline here where Maya was basically leaving us off with the, uh, the ye old trip to Jerusalem there pictured at the top. Um, the inns were, were kind of the earliest version of drinking establishments for, for kind of modern, what we would think of about today in, in British uh, terms. Then you've got the emergence of the 15th through 17th century of, of taverns and alehouses, um, and they were more of the precursor to what we think of today as pubs, um, that they were places where you would have of consumption of both food and drink, oftentimes. So the alehouse tended to cater towards a lower class demographic, and the tavern tended to supply a bit of a upper class experience. So you'd have more wines, for example, rather than the ales, and you'd have uh, maybe a, a better, better selection of, of culinary options. But ultimately, they still both served this, a similar function in, in society. They, they were a place for people to, to have some food and drink and some convivial you know, atmosphere. And then in the eight, 17, end, of the eight, uh, end of the 17th century and the 18th century, you get the emergence of these other spaces, the coffee house and the public houses, um, as well as gentlemen's clubs and society uh, locations. Um, but we're, we're mostly focusing on the, the other, these other establishments. Um, but yeah, so then, and then the Victorian period, you, you basically well and truly have arrived with, with our modern day version of, of what we think of when we have have our mindset of the pub. So it's peculiar then, isn't it? Because it feels like it's something that people would have needed for a very long time. So I mean, why was it only really in the 18th century that this particular kind of establishment, the public house, the pub, actually emerged? Why did it take until the 18th century to emerge? And um, what was, yeah, what was roughly happening in, in the centuries beforehand that enabled it to happen? Well, so as I was say, saying a, a minute ago, like the, prior to, to the late eight, 17th century, you, you really have these spaces serving a, a general function in society of, you know, food and drink. And yes, they could get a bit rowdy at times and people did have a good time, but ultimately that was what they, the purpose of these locations was for. Um, it's at the end of the, the 17th century, you have an expansion of the middle classes in London with, uh, with more free time, more leisure time. And so with that expansion and with the introduction of new and exotic materials like tea and coffee and chocolate and tobacco and gin, these things are all very new and, and uh, they, there were a lot of different ways for people to enjoy them. There were a lot of different variety of places for people to go, but they tended to towards that period start shifting towards the uh, kind of more elite class. They wanted to kind of make things private. So they were all clubs or members only type of locations. And so the public house really becomes this free location where the low, like the lower middle class who still had a bit of leisure time and a little bit of a disposable income had a place they may not have had enough disposable income to spend it on membership fees and things like that. But they also become this hub of uh, communication and exchange of ideas. And uh, and that that really starts to, you really start seeing it coming into its own as this like very, very powerful location for communities to kind of center around. And, and so the pub had a very, very strong role in the communities, at a local level, especially. Yeah, so kind of like a, a reaction against sort of the exclusiveness of some of the more expensive uh, members clubs and in a way to meet up and, and I guess, try, yeah, experience some of the new things that are coming along the trade routes and get together and and chat and talk and converse. Um, so earlier on, I showed off some of the surviving uh, 16th and 17th century pubs that are still around in London. And um, I think a lot of the interiors are probably quite Victorian. They've been remodeled and redone. 
And what we kind of want to do now is learn a little bit more about what they would have actually been like back in the day, back when they were built and, and um, they had their 16th and 17th century clientele. And as archaeologists, we have various different ways of doing this, don't we? We can, um, we can look at different sources of evidence. So we can look at written and verbal evidence like court documents, insurance policies, descriptions, reviews, stories and newspaper articles. Um, we can look at material evidence, as we've already seen, like the pint glasses, the jukeboxes, or at least the 17th century equivalent of that, uh, the wine glasses, shot glasses, plates, cutlery, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but something we haven't touched on yet is the pictorial evidence, like paintings and woodcuts and cartoons, um, or today as it would be if we were there, um, we would be taking photos. And I actually feel like probably the pictorial evidence is probably the one that gives us the strongest impression of what pubs were like at that time. They're probably the most influential and shape what we think we know about pubs and drinking establishments. Um, so it's probably yeah pictures and maybe even what we see in films. These are really what frame our understanding. Um, but Steph, I know you wanted to show us some examples and talk us through why they can be a little bit misleading and why we need to look at the archaeological evidence to understand what was really happening behind the scenes. Sure. So here we have uh, so on this next slide, we've got our wood cart cuttings of, that were largely used in the distribution of ballads and, ballads and other kinds of pamphlets that were spread around homes and things like that that were, were good fun that was a, as a big pastime of, at, at these locations. Um, and so you have these uh, kind of rough drawings. They're not particularly detailed. They, they, they aren't intended to show a, a real true representation of all aspects of the pub and the scenes. Uh, they were just to try to kind of, you know, flag, indicate to people that this was happening at a, a drinking establishment for good cheer and stuff. And then to the to the right hand side, you have a much more detailed drawing, which is a modern rendition of, of a drawing that is taken from descriptions from uh, primary documents, court cases, and, and other other kinds of archival materials describing the spaces. And you can see straight away that there are some similar similarities, and there's also some differences. So you've got a very similar kind of layout of one big room, everybody's sitting at one kind of big table rather than lots of individual spaces. It, and that is very true to what we know about these spaces at the time. Um, on the other hand, you do see some differences in ter terms of types of dress and the clientele coming in to, into these establishments. On the, the wood carving side, these look like patrons at a tavern possibly, they have a bit of a higher status looking uh, attire, whereas on the other on the other side you have a depiction that is a bit more of a, you know, lower class, normal, normal working class wear. Uh, but you also see some other similarities, which is that they all have drinking, uh, you know, tr drinking tankards and other things that would indicate they're having, having beer and wine or they have plates with food on them. So you can tell that at both of these establishments, you're kind of representing a similar thing. You've got people conversing and all that stuff, but neither gives a particularly accurate snapshot in terms of one was drawn with an imagination kind of in, in through a filter from today, looking back at the past. And then the other is just kind of a cart, as you say, a cartoonish kind of just catching the, the, the key features from the time. Um, it's not really until, and those are, so the, the wood carvings are our primary uh, pictorial evidence from this period in Britain, generated in Britain. We have other ones from abroad, which we'll kind of talk about in, in a little bit, but um, it's not really until the 18th century that you start to get really detailed drawings of these spaces. And what you're starting to see happening uh, at this time is a much more rich and symbol symbolic uh, use of, of imagery, uh, and it, it's doing the exact opposite. It's trying to tell you quite a bit about uh, what's going on in these spaces, and maybe trying to do a little bit more than that. Yeah, so these, I mean, these pictures are really interesting. So this is why I wanted to show the flask at Highgate, because that's where uh, William Hogarth was actually doing some of his his sketches, apparently. Um, but yeah, when you look at them, it's almost like on, on the left, you know, you've got 
the it's like the angel and the devil isn't it really on, on the left you've got everyone being really well behaved everything looks quite tame and on the right you've got just absolute chaos um everything is going wrong and beha- people are behaving really badly these are two really strong and really contrasting images there's obviously a lot wrapped up in this um can you unpick it a little bit for us what why yeah. why are we being shown this what's the story so, it? a lot of people probably are familiar with these already they're they're very famous uh p- portraits uh one the one on the left is beer lane uh and the one on the sorry beer street and the one on the right is gin lane and william hogarth drew these uh, and and put them out in publication uh, as part of a campaign against the the vile nature of gin and the the wickedness that comes with with, uh, that that lifestyle. Um, So yes, absolutely, you hit the nail on the head. Um, There is a lot of of reading, but but there's not really much much reading between the lines that's actually necessary. It is very, it's very heavy handed. So in Jen Lane, you, you have it very, very strongly presented to you. You've got mother's ruin just sitting there on the steps, dropping her child over uh, over a very high ledge uh, off, the, off the side there over the banister. You've got a man in the foreground who looks skeletal. He's starving and, and got his, you know, his, you know, flagon next to him. You've got a, a very scary looking creature here in the full foreground looking over here fighting with a dog for a bone. You've got a lot of chaos, as you said, going on in the background. Everything is dilapidated. Everything is falling to parts. You've got some really grim things happening up in the background there. The only thing, in fact, that is uh, orderly and in good, good standing is this building right here, uh, which if you look really quick, if you're if you're familiar, this is the local. This is the symbol for a pawnbroker. So the moneylender is thriving because everybody is 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 pawning all of their possessions in order to to have their fix. Basically, is what is, is being said there. Um, whereas on Gen, on Bear Street, you've got the exact opposite. You've got this tranquil, placid look on the on the man's face. Everything's well kept. He's he's in the process of you know like just sprucing it up. Everybody is. There's bountiful amounts of food, baskets of fish, you know, f- f- just falling out of the basket. Everybody has everything that they can want. Nice full pints of, of beer. Um, everybody's ha- fat and happy and just relaxed and, and everything is in good order, except what you see in the foreground yet again, the one dilapidated building in disrepair is the money lender uh, because nobody needs to pawn anything. Everybody's happy and, and, and everything is is fruitful so so he's not he's not going at it subtly he he is really being very heavy-handed with what he's trying to say uh in in these images yeah so as you say i mean these images like but they're they're the ones that really form a lot of people's impressions of of what things were like at the time you know the idea of mother's ruin and and um and all of that is is very very pervasive um but as you say this i mean there's a lot of politics wrapped up in wrapped up in it this is this is propaganda and this is what the authors want you to believe and and to remember um but fortunately, as archaeologists, we don't have to just rely on these pictures. Um, we don't have to take people's word for it. And we don't have to just take things at face value. We can look at physical evidence and use it to establish whether these kinds of written and pictorial sources are telling the truth or not. Um, so when you were studying and you were examining all of the evidence, what did you actually find? What what did the material evidence reveal about what people were actually getting up to? And does it match this picture that we've all got in our head, courtesy of Hogarth? Yeah, so what, one final thing I'll say before I move on. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So this would have us believe that not only is gin evil and beer is nice and healthy, but it also gives us the, the, the classes that we are we kind of are targeting here. It's targeting the poor, the lower classes in the gin alley that that's almost exclusively who's being it's kind of implying that you can't be wealthy you can't be uh you know in that class if if you if you are are participating in in these kinds of uh substances so what what i we found is at the ale houses um which would have been by all accounts the kind of the, the lower end of the spectrum this would have been the working class kind of environment and atmosphere where you would have the rowdier material. It's not the the, the gin drinkers would have been by the by those uh, images would have been out on the streets in absolute debauchery. But 
ale houses would be, you know, the, the lower class establishments. So what we're finding is what you would pretty much expect to, to find at a lot of these places. We're finding Bardeman jugs, which are, are imported uh, beer jugs, drinking vessels from, uh, from the Rhineland. And you've also got locally made uh, tides, which would have been used for drinking a lot of, and they would have been pretty much ubiquitous across all the drinking establishments at this time in London. These are all 17th century um, materials. Um, and then you also see uh, evidence of food service going on at these locations. So you've got some nice, again, these are these are imports, Delftware imports from, from Germany, uh, from the Rhineland, and you, you see a lot of these kinds of service wares. Uh, notice that they are quite clearly for actual, the actual service of food rather than um, for preparing the food. You wouldn't, you would have been preparing food in, in uh, more basic level materials, um, less, less ornate. So we know that this was for the actual presentation of the meals. Um, so they are, and they're a lot nicer looking than you would expect from, from uh, an ale house. But, uh, but we are seeing, we see this kind of like scattering of material and also activities that you don't always associate with the, that, that class you would think of, oh, drinking halls and things like that, but no, they're actually serving food as well. Um, and then at taverns, uh, the slightly higher uh, material. So this is uh, 18th century, early 18th century uh, stoneware tankard. And this is a nice mug over here. And you see that as, a, as an expected Part of the material record. Um, you've also got some higher end uh, evidence of, of nice glasswares that you're starting to see. Um, these ship forms being being served in, in, out of the, uh, the, the expansion to it for wine and, and sherry and, and other kinds of higher end uh, um, beverages being served. Um, and then we've also got uh, a few of things that might not be quite so, so, uh, so Thoughtful, thought of as, as coming from these establishments. Um, yeah, right. so at this, yeah, I mean, at this point, it's worth just pausing and taking a little bit of stock of what you've just shown us, because what we saw in the historical pictures, they're really, as you said, they're trying to portray the poor people as like inherently bad, and it's their fault, and it's not the gin's fault, and it's not the conditions of society it's the poor people and and they're the problem and that's why everything's going wrong but what we're actually seeing in in the archaeological evidence is something a little bit different isn't it we're we're seeing actually that maybe in the poorer places then they're not actually just going in in to drink they're going in mainly to eat and to meet and to be together and um i think you were going to say something about what it was actually the wealthy, <laughs> um, the wealthy were the ones who were actually drinking the most from what we can see. Yeah, so I will circle back around to that and towards the end of, of the, the talk, but there was a lot of evidence to, to show like, so, so gin actually is introduced into Britain by William of Orange, the, the, uh, the, the monarch at the time. And it's very interesting that within just such a short amount of time, those Hogarth images were being circulated in the 1750s. And it, it only takes about 65 years for, uh, for, for gin to go from this royal drink that is being introduced literally by royalty to having this, this feel that it is dirty and low and, and only something that the poor are doing. But the reality is, is that it wasn't just that, that gin was the evil villain, it was the poor consum consum consuming the, the gin. Um, it was the manner in which they were going about it. It was still fine for the wealthy to consume it uh, in their own as pr private gentleman's club in the form of punch and other kinds of cocktails. Uh, so that becomes very clear very quickly. Um, but at this, for these particular locations, we have uh, we have evidence of very little of the of the uh, the end of the 17th century. Those kinds of exotic in introductions are really still very sparse and far, far few and far between at this point in time. Uh, it really doesn't trickle down to the poor people uh, of London, so to speak, until until you get into the 18th century. And there's a very good reason for that. Um, and it is linked very much to the reason that the legislation, the, the politics that Hogarth was trying to support were coming into play was because it was 
it was free to, to, to produce gin. Uh, you could buy a, a still and you could set that up and there was no duties or any kind of guild fees or anything like that. Whereas beer, you had to be member, you had to be part, you had to pay registry fees and it had to be done in a more proper systematic way. And it was, it was not something that just anybody could, could pick up and, and try to do. Yeah. So that, that, yeah, they were really, I mean, they, as you say, Hogarth was really, um, really had an agenda there and trying, trying to villainize, you know, they were trying to villainize the substance by by blaming the people when really it was a whole host of things going on around it that was that were causing causing the problem. And meanwhile, you've got the rich folk all having a merry old time and um, drinking, drinking away, um, but in private members clubs where where they couldn't be seen um, it's the same old story really isn't it, it sounds very familiar um, but yeah let's move on let's move on to some of the um some of the other things so maybe some of the surprising things that turned up while you were looking at the remains of pubs what's what's next oh yes yeah. so the surprising elements uh really came in the form of hygiene there were lots and lots of these little ointment pots and and medicine pots that we found all over all of these establishments be it the wealthier ones or the poorer ones but well it didn't matter what class uh, the establishment was and what it what it really represents is that ointment they didn't have um, a lot of washing up facilities uh, and and people didn't really have a great understanding of germ theory until a couple hundred years later so what was known was that people had very dry skin, they didn't really have a lot of moisturizer, and this was considered to be essentially the equivalent of hand sanitizer today, or washing up before you have a meal. It was just considered to be a, a, a thing that you would provide your patrons as a, as a as part, part of, of their experience, uh, was little ointment pots that you, you could use to, to put on your hands if they were dry, uh, cracked, or anything like that. So they were found all over the place, and they're very plain, doesn't, they're, they don't, you don't really get fancy decorative ointment pots. They all look the same regardless. Um, you also have some really interesting pieces. This bone uh, piece of carved bone with a, with a little hole in it isn't really old. I found this old uh, image that is a, it's actually part of an enema kit. And it really makes you stop to think about the kinds of things that would be required and how pervasive these things, They're, they were everywhere. And if you read, have you ever read any of Samuel Pepys' diaries, you know how big of a deal those kinds of hygienic issues were and how, how debilitating simple things like, like that could, could really leave a, a person. So it is interesting to see. And then another thing that was of interest was we had a, a, a lot of these glass medicinal vials that we found all over. Um, one of our establishments in particular had quite a number of these, but they were found uh, across the board. And what it is is that these places tended to also be places where you would go and get uh, a tonic for what ails you. Um, they often had a bit of a, of a uh, maybe your, your local uh, chemist would kind of operate almost the pharmacy out, out of the back of one of these rooms possibly. So you, you do see a lot of these kinds of things happening in the same space of all of, all of these locations, which was quite, quite interesting. Um, yeah. Let's see. No, I think it's, it's, it's something that is, seems really surprising, but, but it shouldn't be, but you never see it in, in film depictions or in any of the pictures. It's, um, it's something that seems so simple, but so obvious. I'm not sure though that I would necessarily go to the pub for, medical treatment or an enema. But, um. There you have it. Um, more, more unexpected items um, that you wouldn't necessarily think of uh, as pub or uh, tavern drinking accoutrement, but here you have what you would have all of these things just sitting around in your environment. So these, the, the um, decorative ceramics there are a flower stand and, and a bowl that it would sell on top. So you would stick the stems down uh, through those holes and it would it would have a nice bouquet up at the top. And then you've got these really lovely little um, ornament, these glass ornaments, one of which is a bird feeder and one of which is a dog bowl. Um, and it does remind you, I saw somebody earlier put one of their one of their uh, their things that they remember from their pub is the, the, the pub dog. And it's really not that different. You, in, in many of the wood carvings and things, you might actually see, you see cats, you see dogs, that was, not, that was a part of their life as well. So it's really funny to see some of the things that have survived and some of them that are very delicate as well. Um, to, to, to top it off. 
Yeah, really interesting. It actually reminds me of, um, so yeah, the Mancio that we were excavating in East Yorkshire, we found a flower pot outside there as well. And, you know, it's a tradition that continues today. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, so you've got all these these items, but what, why were they there? What were they doing? So it, I think that it just goes to show that there was a, a lot of kind of, a, there was an atmosphere where people could come and maybe they couldn't afford some of these things. Um, some of them might have been foreign and exotic. Some of them might have been imported from a very far, uh, far, far, far abroad. They might not have been able to afford them in their real life, but they might have been able to in their in their own purses personal private spaces, but they might be able to come to these locations and experience a little bit of that foreign and exotic uh, imports um, that that the pub might have to offer or the tavern or the or the alehouse would would be be kind of producing and, and putting on on offer. Yeah, uh, one and that's a really, really um, interesting point, I think. So maybe, you know, the, the, the pubs or the, the drinking establishments have a little bit of glam. Um, but also the stuff that's in them, we've talked about what it is and what they do and what it tells us about class, but actually where is this stuff coming from? Like, where is it being produced? And what does that tell us about the wider social context of what's happening around here? Yeah, so we, we have touched on some of the, the uh, drinking vessels being imported, you know, a lot of drinking jugs coming from, from the Rhineland. You've got, uh, you've got the, the Delftware coming from from that area as well it was a very very lucrative in, uh, location and very no, well known for its drinking um, culture. Um, but you've also got these other lovely little pieces. A lot of the taverns, the the tavern material that we saw uh, with the a bit higher status material had these this beautiful. A Spanish uh, tankard that was astonishing that it managed to survive uh, so long in, in London uh, old rubbish heap, essentially. You have an example here from the Victorian Albert Museum. Uh, and this little inset here is a, is a um, taken from essentially a Spanish catalog from the 17th century, showcasing the kinds of wares that they, that they were offering for people to import. Um, and here's another uh, shot of it, just the other opposite angle. It's gorgeous. It's, the backdrop changes kind of the color of it, which I think is really cool that it kind of shifts in color. It's the same, same object, but just a little bit different there. But these are being imported from all over. The Spanish, uh, the Spanish significance of this time is that we, there were, there were a lot of conflicts going on, con continental you know, warring with various uh, foreign bodies. And so it would dictate where they were importing. So this period of time, they may have imported from Spain. Another, you know, 15 years on, they may have been only trading with Portugal or, or Italy. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see where, how these different imprints of time kind of reflect who we're kind of allied with and who we're trading with at, the, at that moment in time. Um, so that's quite interesting as well. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the, the people are consuming things, I suppose, at this point, in a way that is quick enough that you can see those patterns reflected. Like if, you know, if, if your trade relations change in just 10 to 15 years, but that is having such a rapid impact that what you see in the pubs is also changing to reflect that. Um, it's, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, but I mean, was there a point at which it changed from being mostly like locally produced to internationally produced? Does that tell us anything as well? Absolutely. So uh, in the 17th century, you end up, they, there were a lot more imports because you had all these new and exotic materials coming in. And so they relied very heavily on, on importing uh, the, the kind of surrounding material to consume it. So you would import from China anything to, to do with tea sets and tea wares. Uh, you, would, you would do the same with uh, a lot of the different material that is coming in from abroad at this time. Uh, but what you start to see, and this is kind of the, the fan, fan, fascinating part about this per particular period, is that very rapidly the local industries catch on and start taking over the production and it just completely impacts the local economy in a completely different way. And so you see very rapidly uh, that local glass houses are starting to uh, up their game in terms of what kind of vessels they're making and producing so that they can have a, a part of the market there. 
And same with the ceramics. Of course, the ceramics industry at this time is exploding with uh, essentially every, you can almost pinpoint it down to the year sometimes with new different uh, transfer patterns or hand decorations or materials or fabrics that are coming out. And it's it gives you a really good insight into the, the speed in which it was essentially their version of computer technology today where things that you know, next year's iPhone is, is our, you know, last year's iPhone is already super out of date, even before this next year is up. So it, it's that kind of kind of mentality it is really early stages of, of what's new and what's fashionable and trendy and technology just advancing really quickly. Um, so that that is tells us loads about that. Yeah, and I think all together it's starting to paint maybe quite a different picture from that one that we started out, um, that one that Hogarth gives us. Um, so yeah, if we start drawing some of these different elements of evidence together, what do we what do we end up with? What's the real picture like? Um, well, when we were talking earlier about the different kinds of arts, art, art in Britain at the time, um, we, I briefly mentioned that the different styles for, were very, you had a very different artistic style upon, in the continent that the Dutch masters were painting at this time. This is a, this is a very uh, real life image and that was very popular at the time was, was true life depictions of just everyday life. And this to me really, I think if of it, all of the different depictions probably rings the truest in terms of what the material that we found in London was actually probably depicting in real life. Um, it, it's a, a working class environment. It looks very domestic. You do have uh, a woman with a baby, but she's not dropping her child over the side. She's over in the corner nursing and it's real life. There's a dog with a child playing in the foreground. You've got food happening. You've got drinks happening. You've got music. You've got, you've got loads of stuff going on. And although it might not be you know, exactly a, a, an image coming straight out of London, uh, it, probably represents a lot truer to form to what is going on. There's loads of, of different things converging all in one space um, rather than just a drinking hall or just a, you know, a, a tavern with, with wine being served and, that, and that's it. So yeah, so that's, that's what I think that the material shows us. Yeah, really, really interesting. It's such a lovely scene as well. And it's, you know, may, maybe the kind of thing you might expect to see still in some places, you know, if you go go with your family for, for lunch and everyone's there and the, the dog's drinking from the dog bowl outside and, um, yeah, you've all been for a country walk and are having a nice time. It seems it's kind of got that kind of vibe going on for us, isn't it? It's um, warm and cosy and family oriented and, you know, people are having a nice time together. Um, yeah. But yeah, as you pointed out in in the background, there is there is a woman. She's there. She's nursing her baby. She's in the pub with everyone else. Um, and maybe that's something that's really worth picking up on. Where where are women in all of this? How do women fit into drinking culture and drinking establishments around this time? So it's fairly common uh, to to kind of picture these spaces as very masculine spaces, and for the whole on the whole, they they really tended to be much more masculine uh, spaces. But that's not to say that women were completely absent. Uh, as you kind of commented on in, in your earlier talk introducing it, women had a very strong role in uh, running these premises. They, they, it was one of the few um, kind of things that they could actually do. It was one of the, the few occupations that could, a woman could hold and have a respectable kind of uh, earn a living essentially if you were a widow or if you were um, you know a single woman who didn't have a husband this was something that you, you know you didn't you didn't look like you were you know doing something improper by by, by taking this on um, but that's not to say that there weren't women in the pubs I'll, I'll otherwise um, we've got a great little uh, story here about a woman named Elizabeth Case, who um, who routinely kept company with her male drinking companions, and she would keep pace with them, and she would participate. So pay, they, the, there were women patrons that were were you know coming into these places too. Uh, it might be less uh, visible. They might not be the most um, the most commonplace in the in this in this in this whole story, but. They do happen. It was more common for women to be there and, you know, with with their husband, you know, at a tavern for a meal or 
as the girlfriend, maybe um, there were, there are definitely those examples, but they that's not you know not to say that they there aren't any examples of women um, giving as good as as their their drinking buddies at the at the pub could could keep up with. So uh, so yeah, it's it's quite an interesting uh, exploration into uh, where the women do come to the foreground in these spaces. Yeah, and so that's kind of I suppose where they fit in in terms of ale houses and taverns and pubs and so on. Um, but there was another type of material evidence that you were talking to me earlier about um, that suggested there was something else going on, almost like a whole other type of establishment emerged. Um, That's right. Yeah. So in this kind of changeover period, you also see the introduction of tea and coffee. And what you see happening by the middle, really the middle of the 18th century, is that women start to have a whole new uh, kind of venue that they can explore safely. It's not considered to be uh, a, ma a man's man's world only. Um, it's funny because in the 17th century, this there's this uh, this little poem here, this this um, old ballad that talks about the the evilness of of uh, this vile uh, introduced new introduced substance of coffee. And it's quite funny. It's it's a it's a very humorous little um, poem, but in just, again, very short order, this new substance, on, just like gin, which was originally introduced by the royals and thought was a great new new thing, it gets a completely different kind of impression on it by the middle of the 18th century, where it's a very safe, wholesome drink. It doesn't cause inebriation. You don't lose your, you know, your judgment. Tea still is the more genteel of the two. It's more mild. It's more, it's more tame. So, so coffee does very much kind of stick to the male dominated world, but it does give women options uh, that are not alcoholic, which was another thing that was a great, uh, great introduction because prior to this, the water sources were not clean. So as I think most people by this point already realized that that was one of the reasons beer and ale became such a staple in Britain was because it was a, the alcohol killed bacteria and made it a safer drink to, 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 to consume. Um, but tea and coffee did the same thing, unbeknownst to them, boiling the water to infuse the tea leaves or to get the to extract the, the oils from the bean did the same thing. It killed all of the germs. And so people got less ill whenever they drank it. So they associated all of these drinks as much healthier and much more wholesome uh, than than the alternatives. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of um, surprising, surprising things coming out of this, I think. And um, yeah, the idea that the it's almost like the period where marketing to women in a way begins and they kind of get their own place to socialize in public. Um, which is a bit a bit different. And meanwhile, you've got men still drinking punch and uh, having having a good time in punch clubs. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's in, it's interesting in in the sense that it's something that almost emerges for for women, and it's it's a, a, a safe space, as we'd say today, for for women to to be together and to go out and and to live their lives um, in public. Um, but there's 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 more surprising more surprising things to come, I think, still. So we've looked a lot at the material evidence and, and what that tells us um, about pubs, but there's other kinds of evidence as well. And we've sort of touched on some of them. Um, and, you know, when we picture people out in a pub in, in the 16th or 17th century, we picture them maybe singing and making merry and, and having a and, and having a good old, good old times. So is there anything that can tell us, um, tell us maybe about this side of things? You know, we've seen an image where people are having, you know, a, you know, a lovely kind of family time and, you know, got a Sunday lunch vibe and it's, it's that kind of thing. But that wasn't the only thing going on, was it? No, that's, that's very true. So, um, so we have a few examples of some, some of the more uh, interesting uh, raucous activities. So here's a, here's a coming, circling back to the, to the, the more uh, the, the upper classes getting a little bit out of hand. Um, so this is a punch bowl. This is a punch scene. This is another William Hogarth uh, image that's drawn to, to kind of give you an insight of what's going on in some of these. So this is a, 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 call, a, a drawing called 
um, Midnight Modern Conversations. And it's kind of talking about the fact that these places were often used, the, especially the, the gentry were, were kind of using these as ex, uh, places to have excuses to go for their, their meetings or their, their you know, political uh, debates and things like that. But oftentimes, uh, af after a few punch bowls had been consumed, things kind of got a little out of hand and they, they became a little bit, uh, you know, unruly. But again, it's interesting the different way that, that one is considered to be just, you know, gentlemen being, being a little bit raucous. And then uh, if it's happening out in the streets and you didn't have the, the fancy, fancy wigs on and, and all that such, uh, it's considered to be, you know, debauchery and, and, and vileness. Um, so that's when, one of the things that you, you can kind of see happening. Um, and another thing you can see happening is that there is a... This interesting, this interesting phenomenon that you, you get with drinking games and, and other kinds of kind of lewd behavior happening in these in these establishments. And one of them was was found in this one of the establishments that I had my materials studying for. Uh, they were found in this, this is called uh, Paternoster Square, is, is right here just on the doorstep of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Um, and it would have been if you recall, at the end of the 17th century, it was a brand new pristine structure right after the Great Fire. It had just been constructed and completed, uh, Christopher Wren's masterpiece there. Um, and so this would have been an area that was very much in the shadow of this very, very famous religious uh, institute. And what we found, <laughs> what at, and I think a few of you even mentioned this, possibly one of the pubs that you like, um, at the Old Cheshire Keys, uh, just in this part of the, of London, not too far away. And at my site, we found a couple of really, really interesting um, objects. One is a uh, an erotic um, tile that was found at the Old Chester Cheese. This was not one of my sites. But the other one is altogether more ridiculous in some <laughs> respects, but also just baffling because it's it's not found very often in Britain. You've got a few examples that, that you get quite often in Europe, but you've got it's a it's a phallic drinking cup. And it was probably one of these these uh drinking games. It was associated with a with an uh a gentleman's drinking game um that was going on in these locations. So you get some really surprising <laughs> material. And it was a it was a cup that you drank out of and and so you we know that it was it was uh from one of these establishments which is which is just absolutely a fantastic insight into the kind of um uh, humors and good good kind of I guess and naughty sometimes behavior that was was happening at, at these locations. So. Yeah, a bit of a rowdy, you know, rowdy drinking game, you know, the kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it goes, it's amazing to see it's happening right under the nose of St. Paul's Cathedral as well, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's right. And and the interesting thing about this is that this particular the, the 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 drinking cup is a is a 17th century example, which we don't really have very much of uh, from that kind of period. We do see a few of them kind of coming in, but yeah, there it's it is it's a just altogether not what you expect. Yeah, well, I think that's been a really really fascinating whip through. Um, the emergence of, of pubs in London. And, you know, we've had a really good look at the different kinds of culture that's going on in different establishments over the course of two or 300 years. And it's see the kind of foundations that have led to the emergence of where we are today in terms of our modern pub culture. Um, I think at this point, we've still got a little bit of time left and uh, we've got a lot of questions in the Q&A. So, um, yeah, why don't we move move over to the Q&A and start answering some questions. I mean, thank you so much, Steph, for uh, an, amazing, an amazing presentation and lots of really, really interesting um, artifacts that you've shown us there. Oh, um, my pleasure. A couple of people have asked, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the places where some of them were found? So we've seen, we've seen the last one right on the steps of St Paul's Cathedral, pretty much. But where, where do some of the other artifacts that you showed us come from? So all of my uh, finds that I showed, with the exception of the tile <laughs> on, the last, on the last slide, um, came from within the walled city uh, of London. So um, two of the sites were right near to the London Guildhall, if any of you are familiar 
very much with the, the center of London. It's very, very central. And then the other sites were in that little shrine right next to St. Paul's Cathedral. So there were uh, three sites that were right at the, in the foothill, like right in the like in the shadow of St. Paul's, uh, but they all kind of backed onto one another. So it, it they they three different establishments, but kind of sharing back back quarters. And then two, one was an inn over by the Guild Hall, and one was a tavern um, by the Guild Hall. So there you go. Fascinating. Um... Quite a lot of people are really fascinated um, by the ointment pots and the idea that people would have been having medical treatment or or, or having that kind of thing in in a pub. Uh, it does seem kind of strange, um, but I think you know in the same way that you know we're all used to having um, hand sanitizer on the tables now, it would have been a similar sort of thing with the ointments um, back then. Mm. A few people have asked whether. Um, how do you know that they were ointment pots? Um, could they have been another type of pot, like for potted meats or potted shrimp? Or is there some way of telling what these oint what these pots were for? How do we know they're ointment pots? They, yeah, very good question. Um, it they have a very prescriptive size, and and uh, again, as you saw in those images that I had up there, they they almost all look identical. So all across the city, not just at drinking establishments, these were ubiquitous across every kind of domestic space, every location basically that people would come and sit for any length of time or want to kind of relax. So whether it's your own personal private home, an inn where you're providing accommodation, um, or uh, again, obviously, as we now know at these drinking establishments, which was, I think, kind of a new revelation because you, you don't always associate, you wouldn't necessarily associate that. The ointment pots themselves, you, you can see lots of typologies that have been developed over uh, time that they, they, they look very similar to one another. Um, there's just almost never any uh, embellishment on them. They, they kind of fall into a very specific pattern. Whereas again, with, with food uh, presentation and service, you would see um, that if they were, if you were, if they were for potted, you know, meats or anything like that, you would see some kind of variation in styles or probably decoration. They, they tend to be a little bit less stick to this kind of prescriptive thing. Um, that was something that I learned new uh, to this as well, because because ointment pots particularly were not something that was in my kind of wheelhouse prior to doing this research. But again, with going back to the kind of these med medical treatments kind of happening at these places, it was medicine was very kind of class limited. Um, you, you, you really couldn't, most people couldn't afford doctors. So a lot of people did rely upon your kind of local medicine, uh, you know, wives tales. The whole reason that you had so many wives tales about what, how to treat certain illnesses and ailments was because medical knowledge was kind of very limited. You didn't have a huge amount of, of uh, medical books or knowledge being disseminated to the common people. Uh, and and that was, you know, that was true for, for many centuries. Uh, it took a long, that was, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. Very interesting though. I highly recommend exploring that because you'll go down, you'll go, if you're interested at all, you'll go down many avenues just to find out about like the medical. Well, that leads me perfectly on to the next question, because a lot of people are really interested in learning more, not just about um, the medical side of things, but just about the history of pubs in general. And, you know, obviously part of the reason why you did this study was because there wasn't that much existing um, archaeological stuff for people to read. Um, but are there any any books that you can recommend, any, any sort of history books that you could recommend to people right now if you want to go away and uh, order one straight away? Yes, absolutely. So there, there's one camera, actually, the Campaign for Real Ale uh, has recently just uh, put out a book, a series uh, of London historic pub in London. Uh, it's called, I think, The Public House. I'll put, uh, I think we have a have a, copy, a link for that. Um, if, you, if you're interested in, in ones that are still up, upstanding that you might be able to visit. I think that it has a has a lot of them that you can kind of still see there today. Um, it, they are more recent for the most part. Again, in that particular part of the city as well, most of them were destroyed in the Great Fire. There are some ones that still exist from the late 17th century, as, as Maya pointed out. So that was really good. So if you if you want, um, maybe we can put that as well somewhere if you, if you can. Um, but then if you're just interested in the historical kind of aspects of it, there are a lot of really good resources. Um, we'll, we'll include those 
as well. But um, but there there's a lot of historical resources. Mostly, there hasn't been a whole lot of archaeological um, work done on these places. A lot of people don't see the the point of it because it's so recent. But actually, what what we find is that just because you've got paintings and pictures depicting these spaces and songs and and things talking about them. It, it's not quite the same as what the picture that is drawn whenever you actually start looking at the material record. And a lot of these spaces wouldn't have been in the material record. So, or, or in the uh, written record, they were, they were probably not important enough or registered. So, so that's also a good reason as well. So. Yeah. I mean, people can say one thing and they do another and the material evidence, it, it shows us that. And it shows us, as you say, the stuff that doesn't make it into the written record because either some people don't, the people who write the written record don't know about it or because they're not interested. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've got this really good question here from Scott who asks, was there ever any combination of coffee houses and pubs or were they always separate establishments? Well, that's a good question. I can't, entirely rule out that they couldn't have possibly crossed over but the coffee house was a, a pretty a pretty unique space for for kind of uh putting together political ideas and thoughts and people would go there to kind of stimulate social conversation and things like that um and the pub was too but they tended to work almost like there, there is a historical, I can't remember the, the reference from it, this is from my, back in my, when I was studying, but basically there was this kind of idea that you would, women hate, wives would hate uh, that, that the invention of coffee, or the introduction of coffee, because her, their husbands would be lost to the pub from, from evening until, till dawn, and they'd get so drunk at the pub, and then they'd stumble into the coffee houses and get sobered up by the coffee, and then the cycle would just continue and, and and they never saw their husbands. It was some, 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 some little line and I can't remember. So they, they definitely serve a different kind of role early on in those, in those days. Obviously today we have like, you know, the pub is everything. It's, you, you have your coffee, you can have your cocktails, you can have all these different things. But, um, but back then, you, again, they, they were very kind of different atmospheres with different functions. Yeah. And it's amazing as well. I think, um, how quickly that culture changes. I mean, can you imagine walking into Starbucks these days, half drunk and banging on the table and wanting to tell everyone your political opinion? I mean, that's not what coffee places are for anymore. It's And it's only been, a, you know, 100, 200 years, really, and it's changed dramatically. So it's a really important and, and interesting thing to study. Um, let's have a look for some other questions. Um, a few people have wanted to just go back to that picture, um, the Dutch painting, and people are just interested in, in who painted it and when it dates from. Uh, yes, I think that is it's by uh, Jan, uh, Jan uh, Steer, is that, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, let me just see if I can have the reference in my, in my file. Um, Jan Steen is who painted that. Um, and I'm pretty sure, oh, let's see. Oh, I can put that in the in the notes as well. Um, but it, he's one of the Dutch masters. Um, and you, you do see quite a number of beautiful paintings coming out. I like that one because it had the depiction of the mother nursing. And I thought that was a nice way of kind of like showing a more realistic view of, of probably how these spaces were used as opposed to the the William Hogarth which I'm sure that they're again gin gin was a very you know contentious and substance initially it, it, it was very volatile but it wasn't because of the people it was because they didn't know it was very different to to, to alcohol uh, at the time beer and ale were normally one two percent what we're <laughs> what they're used to drinking uh, versus a spirit which is altogether much more toxic and potent whenever drunk in large quantities. So, um, but yeah, um, we'll put that, we'll pop the uh, references to the photos in there. Yeah, so we will we will follow up this talk with an email with lots of footnotes and links to things that you can follow up with, including uh, a recording of the talk so that you can re-watch it, uh, especially if you're interested in our historic pub recommendations that we covered at the beginning. Um, Grant has a really good question, I think, and he asks, what sort of food was provided in these various establishments? Can we tell what people were actually being served? Oh, 
very, very good records for this from, from Samuel Pepys' uh, diary. So if you have any interest whatsoever, he's, he's a fantastic source for these kinds of things. He loves talking about food. Um, it was very meat heavy, uh, meat and bread heavy. Um, vegetables, fresh vegetables especially, were considered to be unhealthy. <laughs> Um, so he talks, it's funny to, to listen to, to him talk about how he got sick and it was probably because he had some of this, you know, lettuce or what, he'll talk about different vegetables that, that were probably the source of, of his bad stomach. He has a lot of bad stomach uh, issues, which is, which is really amusing to kind of, kind of not really funny, but yeah, it, it's not something that we would normally think about putting, committing to diary for, for many, the posterity of future generations today, I think. But, um, but I would recommend as a source for talking about that, but cheese and, and meat, um, those were very popular uh, at, at the pubs. Well, they, I mean, they remain pretty popular today as well. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mary's got a great question as well. Um, what opening hours did they have? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm not entirely sure if there was a standardized uh, opening service but again Samuel Pepys talks about going popping into the tavern for his his breakfast some days or to, to get a small beer that was often the way that they started their day was with 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 a, a, a low alcohol content beer um, and so sometimes he would go go straight to to the pub if he he didn't want to sit around and have wait for uh, you know some something to be whipped up in his own home um, so, so that that would imply that there were establishments that were operating pretty much at any any hours of the day for meals. That's the other thing to consider about these these venues is that at that especially in the 17th century, they were operating a lot of the time to serve members of the community who didn't maybe have access to a kitchen that or cooking supply. So bachelors who were like, you know, stationed in the military, maybe soldiers or. Um, tradespeople who who didn't have a family yet and so maybe had rooms in a in an establishment but didn't have uh, a, their ho a home of their own yet or a wife that would be, be cooking for them they were out working and I know that sounds very kind of uh you stuck in the past but we're stuck in the, it was part of the, the way society tended to work back then and it, they especially in an urban atmosphere that was very trade heavy there wasn't always space or time for people to have uh, space to cook their own meals or the resources to do so was often much more cost effective. They could get a cheaper meal than it would cost for them to buy in all the ingredients themselves to do it or have the cookware, for example, to do it. So, so they often were, would be places that were available for, for those daily meals. So. Yeah, really interesting. Um, Sally would like to know if you found any remains of musical instruments at all amongst the rubble. No, we didn't find anything like that. Uh, we did have very, I, we, I should keep saying we, but I, it was my, during my research, the, the assemblages that I used that uh, from the Museum of London um, were all exclusively clearance deposits. So that means that they were basically, they were stripped of any contextual information and they had all just been deposited at the end of the life of the establishment and swept into essentially a cesspit or a, a, a rubbish midden. And then they were covered over um, and, and that was all that really remained for most of these uh, establishments, maybe some foot, footers from the, the, the layout of the actual foundation space, but not a whole lot left. So it was very important for, the re for this research that we, we'd be able to tell as much as we could from the objects themselves because we didn't have the context uh, information that we normally rely so heavily upon. Um, so it was a real challenge to try to figure out new ways to talk about what the materials themselves can actually tell us um, about, about society and people using the material. Um, we've got maybe five minutes left, so I'm going to pick just a couple more little questions out. Um, but I like the comment that Angelique has just made, uh, going back to the to the Dutch painting, and she says that in Holland we even have a saying, a household of Jan Steen, when things are a little bit messy, um, <laughs> which I think is is just great. Um, so we've covered kind of what food was was being eaten, and um, I think. The next question that we should cover will be a question from Jay, who asks about the ceramic pipes that were shown. Um, is there anything else that you can tell us about those? 
Well, um, so tobacco is not something that most of us stop to think about as it being introduced as a foreign and exotic good, but it was also being introduced right around this period. So it was a, it was a new foreign import. And so it, it really takes off in this kind of the six, this 17th century uh, period. And it, it really is quite successful as in terms of its, it's a uh, taking hold in, in the populace. And we all, I guess, know a little bit as to why that might be nowadays, um, which they didn't really realize at the time, but we have so much, so much evidence of uh, these, these clay tobacco, tobacco pipes. Um, some of the establishments had uh, literally hundreds that we recovered fragmentary more, more often than not. We only have a very rare few that, that came out as well intact as that, the one that I had in my, in my um, slideshow. Um, but yeah, they, they have a, a, again, a very specific kind of, these are very perfunctory objects. So there's not a, although you do get pipe bowl decoration that comes in and you can get a little bit fancy with that for the most part, pipe stems are so prescriptive that you can, you can kind of gauge and how we kind of talk about the time period that they're from is based on the size of the hole that, that, the, that is uh, in the, the center of the pipe stem itself. So there's so much consistency with how they are and it gets, over time, you get, you get a, a larger and larger hole and they, you, you get some variations, the thickness of the stem and things like that, but on the whole, there's not a whole lot of change. It's a pretty, it's a pretty, uh, steadfast um, product over the course of the next 200 years until you start getting more temporary uh, or disposable. But they were, at that time, before you had rolling papers and things like that that we have today, truly disposable products, they were considered to be disposable. And you just crack the end of the pipe off. That's why you find so many pipe stems that are just cracked off. And you would continue smoking it until the pipe was down to a little nubbin at the very bottom. And then you would throw it away and get a new one. So it was it was the closest thing to disposable um, uh, objects that you, you kind of had at the time. And they were yeah very, very popular at all of the locations, but especially at the ones near St. Paul's. <laughs> Okay, so I feel like our next question might open a whole new can of worms and we could probably do a whole other talk on this topic. But <laughs> one thing we haven't touched on, um, as has been pointed out, is uh, theatre pubs. Um, and so, yeah, for example, there was an archaeological dig, I think, by Museum of London. At, was it the Boar's Head Theatre Pub? Um, mm. I'm not sure. Yeah, can, <laughs> it's already outside of my remit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it's a very different type of establishment. And um, yeah, I was basically just going to ask, um, yeah, how might this look different, I suppose, in the archaeological record to the kind of pubs that you've been looking at? I'm not sure. I, I really am not very well suited. To, I could speculate only, but um, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Um, can you talk talk about the the use of these spaces and what was going on at them a little bit, and maybe we can pontificate? But it would just be guesswork from my end. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna suspect that there was um, people would have been having snacks and uh, watching watching plays, really. So I think maybe we should follow this one up with uh, mm. another talk in the future because yeah there was there was a, I know there was a big excavation at, at one of them um in the last couple of years and it would be a really interesting thing to look into a bit more um so let's have one last question before we head off into the night and finish our pints and place our last orders Jonathan would like to know was there any evidence of gambling within these establishments well, there is definitely going to be evidence elsewhere. We didn't find any in uh, the, the establishments that I was looking at again, um, but that is definitely something that we have plenty of evidence of. Even in those little wood cut cuttings, we have evidence that, that, that there were plenty of, of pub games and gambling going on. Um, it's talked about, again, Samuel Pepys, great, great resource for, for talking about some of the different games and, and activities that happened in those pubs, in the pubs. But in terms of what we actually had in these uh, very small, uh, this limited amount of material, I didn't, I did not have any. The, 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 the drinking game evidence was the was the phallic cup which was a pretty pretty good find I have to say it was pretty st uh, pretty stellar um it might not be everybody's cup of tea pun intended 
Um, but <laughs> it was it was certainly a, especially the with the decorative pattern. So we know that there are all manner of kind of games going on. Um, but but yeah, that that's definitely gambling was a big a big one for a lot of these locations, a lot of establishments. Okay, I think we've got time for just one one quick little question, one last little question. Um, so a lot of people do want to know what our favourite historic London pubs are. Is there one, maybe two, that you can recommend? What are your favourite ones out of all of them? Well, I am always partial to a Sam Smith pub. They nice, nice locations normally, and they always have a good uh, kind of economic uh, offering. Um, very standard fare, but but I think the one that you had in your in your slideshow, the Chandros on in uh, I think it is in Trafalgar Square is a is a good one. Um, but yeah, there's loads. Of, there's so many. I, I I haven't even scratched the surface. I did try to do a little bit of primary research on London extant London pubs, but uh, it just didn't. It, it was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't rationalize. Yeah, if you take a walk through Greenwich, I mean, there's loads, isn't there? And um, yeah, I mean, we'll include we'll include a couple of suggestions um, of ones that we like in in our follow up email. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like the prospect of Whitby. I like the George in London Bridge. Um, that's a good one. Uh, oh, I, I, I'm not going to start because we'll we'll never leave. We'll we'll be here all night if I just start naming naming great pubs. Um, well, thank you so much to Steph for a really, really fascinating talk and for sharing all of your all of your studies with us. It's been really, really interesting. Oh, my um, pleasure. Before we head off, um, I'd just like to point people to a couple of things that we've got coming up that you might be interested in. So we are about to launch two new archaeological digs. Um, we've got one that will be taking place in Scotland, where we will be investigating the ruins of a medieval castle, uh, just about 20 miles outside of Glasgow. We're also going to be starting a new dig at a coastal fort dating all the way back to the Iron Age in Carefi, Pembrokeshire. And this fort is, it's, it's incredible. Not only is it stunning with huge, huge ramparts, but unfortunately it is slowly falling into the sea due to climate change. So we're gonna be heading out there this summer to try and rescue as much evidence from the site as possible. And if any of you would like to join us, you'll be able to find all of the information on our website at digventures.com. Um, in terms of online events, um, next month we will be back on with Archaeology Book Club and we'll be talking to Becky Rag Sykes about her book Kindred, um, all about the Neanderthals. So if you'd like to join us for that, then um, yeah, head to our website digventures.com forward slash calendar to see everything that is coming up. And if you've enjoyed tonight's talk and want to help us do more like it, um, then do think about becoming a subscriber because that's how we put these events on. Um, these events are fully supported by our community, by people like you who want to hear more about archaeology and really get into the weeds of it all with us. Um, so anyway, thank you all so much for coming. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you all here and to share this discussion with you. I hope that we'll see some of you at future events and um, it's been, yeah, it's been an absolute delight. What else can I say? Cheers to you all. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>